Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Bresley. I'm the manager of the FAA Small Business Program. Before we, be we begin, I want to make everyone aware that this webinar is, is being recorded and is streaming live. The slides presented today, along with this recorded webinar, will be made available on the FAA's bipartisan infrastructure law site. This webinar is scheduled for one hour as was advertised. I apologize for any confusion if your calendar invite shows longer than that. So with that, welcome to the second webinar on bipartisan infrastructure law hosted by the FAA's Small Business Program. For awareness, I will be commonly referring to bipartisan infrastructure law as BIL. This webinar, as well as our first webinar, is focused on the FAA's air traffic facilities since it is the only area of BIL investment anticipated to result in contract opportunities. Our first webinar, which is currently available on the FAA's BIL site, included some insight into acquisition plans for air traffic facilities, along with some helpful resources available to small businesses. For this second webinar, we'll provide some additional insight on available resources, including a, some special presentations on DOT's bonding education program, as well as the SBA surety bond guarantee program, as there will be BIL funded contract opportunities that require being bonded. We'll also end today's presentation with members of the FAA's Air Traffic Facilities and Services Organization presenting a deep dive into some of their programs to provide insight into some of the areas that will result in contract opportunities. Before we begin, I also wanted to mention that we plan on utilizing the remaining time of this one hour webinar after all presentations are completed to address your questions. However, if you'd like us to address your question, you must please put your questions into the Q&A chat. Next slide, please. Here's a look at what we plan on covering today and the plan order at which we, we plan to cover it. I'll start by providing awareness of a recent AMS uh, interim update that pertains to BIL funded acquisitions. And then as mentioned, we'll go over some of the helpful resources that are available to small businesses and then finish our presentations with um, insight into air traffic facility programs that will result in contract opportunities. Next slide, please. As mentioned in our first webinar, I want to remind folks that FAA acquisition does not fall under the federal acquisition regulations that other agencies fall under. FAA's acquisition and resulting contract opportunities falls under the FAA's own acquisition management system, better known as the AMS, and to uh, see the, the most up-to-date documents that comprise the AMS, see that first FAST link. And then for awareness, the AMS does allow for non-competitive awards to the types of small businesses identified on this slide. And there was a recently signed and released interim change to increase the non-competitive threshold for BIL funded acquisition to allow for non-competitive contract awards to those types of small businesses identified there. Um, and it increased to 10 million or below, and, and again, only for acquisitions uh, that include bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, I did wanna note, we didn't include service disabled veteran owned small businesses in this interim update because that threshold did not require an increase. And as you can see, it's in place through FY26 and you can find a copy of the memo in the second link above there. And then um, for additional information regarding small business and uh, non-competitive awards, see those AMS sections at the bottom. Next slide, please. So um, when speaking of helpful resources uh, available to small businesses, I need to start with the FAA Small Business Program team. They are a wonderful resource, willing and able to provide guidance and assistance on navigating FAA acquisition. Uh, so I encourage you to reach out to them. I did also wanna note for small businesses, um, companies that are looking to submit a capability statement and are interested in BIL funded opportunities, please submit your capability statements to the small business program team and we'll do and we'll make sure they are appropriately considered. And then uh, just some helpful links on the bottom right there to the small business site, uh, which contains actually the links that are below it. And the team page uh, has the, the team members in it. And then uh, I did wanna particularly point out the doing business with the FAA as a small business page as well as the program manager's corner page, particularly if you're a company uh, learning to do business with the FAA, those are two great resources to start with. Next slide, please. So here are just some key resources available for FAA uh, BIL investment uh, that I did want to point out, starting with the overarching FAA BIL site. Uh, it actually contains the three pages below it 
uh, which are the three areas of BIL investment, but also contains a getting started area, which has great resources and actually has the recording of our first webinar. And then moving on, you have the air traffic facilities area of BIL investment. Um, it, it contains a lot of good planning uh, insight and uh, resources. And again, that's the intended intended area of BIL investment that our webinars will be covering because they are likely to result in contract opportunities. But then um, the next two areas, airport terminals and airport infrastructure, um, those two areas of BIL investment have their own great pages and have a lot of insight on them. Uh, they are intended to be funded through grant opportunities. They also include mechanisms to ask additional questions. So if you're interested in those types of airport grant opportunities, I suggest you check those two pages out. And then just some reminders on some resources that uh, we get frequent questions on SAM.gov. You need to be registered in SAM.gov in order to be eligible for a contract award. And then you have our procurement forecasts on FAA's site as well as DOT's site. Uh, they're just a great way to get early awareness of opportunities before they're actually posted on SAM.gov. And then interested, if you're interested in subcontracting opportunities, check out our subcontractor directory, which has uh, our major prime contractors uh, and, and points of contact associated with those. And then uh, we just added this uh, just late, uh, it just came up last week that um, we had a new announcement uh, for a source of sought on a QVL intended to be used uh, for BIL funded projects. Um, it's a support um, QVL uh, that's looking at particularly for um, small businesses of the major socioeconomic type. So I urge you to check that one out. It actually uh, opened last week and closes uh, next week. So please check it out. And with that, we'll start our section on bonding resources. And I'll be handing it off. Uh, speaking for DOT's bonding education program is Lisa Leone. Lisa. Thank you so much, Alan. First, I would like to say uh, congratulations to everyone who signed on today. You're in a good spot uh, seeking out information. We appreciate that. Uh, next slide, please. So as Alan mentioned, I'm the bonding education uh, program manager here at USDOT. And our mission is uh, to help small businesses increase their economic competitive, competitiveness and to maximize their opportunities in becoming not only surety bonded, but in their ability to compete for transportation related contracts. That's really the point and the mission of our bonding education program is not only to help a small business get bonded and learn about that, but also to be a stronger business overall. And we accomplish that through our small business transportation resource centers. Next slide, please. And we have 11 small business transportation resource centers or SBTRCs located around the country. Uh, here's a map, a visual image to see how each center covers a few states. Uh, and in that, in that region, each one of these centers have uh, close contact with the projects, with the DOTs uh, in each state and the supportive services available there and they work together to bring people to the table for a bonding education program. They provide technical assistance at these centers for all small and disadvantaged businesses. Um, they are required to produce at least two BEPs, bonding education programs a year. To find the nearest SBTRC uh, near you, I suggest you uh, click on this hyperlink in the slide and we all, I also have uh, links at the end of the presentation as well, and you can find the one that is uh, supports your region. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, the BEP components, just to give you a quick overview, uh, the, it's really a four-part uh, situation for the, the Small Business Transportation Resource Center. First, they get stakeholders together. They bring everybody together who will have um, an input and will assist you in um, the bonding, when you attend the bonding education program. And that that will take place in a matter of, over the course of 10 hours of training, whether it's virtual, whether it's hybrid or in-person, each region uh, and depending on the situation with COVID, obviously uh, they have been um, flexible with that. Uh, you, during this time of training and um, business prep, 
you also get bond readiness and meet one-on-one -on -one with a surety professional. And then after the program is over, we encourage everyone to continue to get follow-up technical assistance from their SBTRC and that continued relationship building with primes and local contractors and all of the business, um, all of the opportunities that are being available, made available through BIL. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a sample slide to tell you uh, truly the list of topics. So that's why I say it's not just about bonding, it's truly business development course. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a requirement. You have to have your you have to have your business for at least two years, have at least a two hundred fifty thousand dollar annual income. Now we, revenue, um, we were flexible with this for COVID, so um, still apply if you're a little under that. Uh, you must have a minimum of two employees and be uh, working, have performance in the construction industry and pursuing transportation related contracts. That's the, the main issue here. Next slide, please. Uh, you have to be a small business, uh, a DBE or a hub zone or an SDB service disabled. Any one of these uh, makes you eligible for the class as well. Next slide, please. This is just a uh, quick review. You can read it in detail, but basically what we have here is a woman who had um, a company. She was a consultant and then wanted to become, uh, she was a consultant in this industry and then wanted to get her own transportation or construction uh, company. And she did that. And she sought out information, attended a bonding education program in Dallas and uh has a capacity now, bonding capacity of $3 million with a bank line of credit and is currently working for a project in the DFW airport. Next slide, please. I have information for, uh, for all of our transportation resource centers. Again, there's a link to it, but here you have the people that are associated with each center. And then in the next slide, you have, um, thank you, you have our team at OSDBU at DOT where you can reach out to us for anything um, that you need assistance with. If you can see the advocates here, if you are a service disabled veteran or an 8A or hub zone, we have an advocate specifically for you to help you. Next slide, please. And here are the resources and the links that I told you about. Uh, please, uh, you know, visit these links at your uh, nearest opportunity. And uh, just remember, we're always here to help you. Thank you so much. Next slide. All right, back to you, Alan. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, next up, we have uh, Tamara Murray, who is presenting on the SBA Surety Bond Guarantee Program. Tamara. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to connect with the small businesses that are joining us today. So thank you very much. And I always love to follow Lisa. The Bonding Education Program is really a great resource for small businesses. So, um, But SBA's Surety Bond Guarantee Program has been helping track bonds for over 50 years. Not all small businesses know that we've been around that long. Next slide, please. SBA guarantees the four contract bonds that small businesses need to secure all types of contracts and subcontracts, up to six and a half million dollars, and then on direct federal contracts, up to ten million dollars. Now, typically, it's small businesses in construction uh, that need these bonds to qualify for government and other contracts, but you may also need contract bonds if you perform services, manufacture products, or supply materials. So we're not just restricted to providing contract bonds for construction. So keep that in the back of your mind. Next slide, please. What we do here at SBA is we help level the playing field for small businesses by guaranteeing 80 or 90% of the bond's value based on the demographics of your small business. That means that your surety company only risks 10 or 20% of the contract value because they have SBA's guarantee to rely on. And that makes the surety companies partnering with SBA more willing to take on additional risk when a small business really needs assistance with their bond program. Next slide, please. 
So if your business is having trouble obtaining bonding, or if you need higher bond limits, the Surety Bond Guarantee Program from SBA can help with that. Surety companies who have SBA's guarantee will often give small businesses more bonding capacity with less capital. They will also consider the unused portion of your working capital bank line of credit if you have one to help increase your bonding capacity even further. It's all about SBA's guarantee on your bonded contracts. Next slide, please. We approve our bond guarantees in about two days on average, and we have a streamlined quick app program that requires less paperwork and allows us to approve a bond guarantee in about 24 hours on bonds that are $400,000 and smaller. So we're not adding a whole lot of time onto your normal bond application process for you to obtain SBA's bond guarantee. Next slide, please. Now, when you're awarded a contract and need a performance or payment bond guarantee, you'll pay SBA a contractor's fee of 0.6% of the contract value. That's your payment for SBA's guarantee. So factor that into your job cost. You'll also pay the surety's premium that they charge separately from SBA's fee. So just keep those in mind. Most of the small businesses who partner with SBA are paying less than two and a half percent combined premium between the premium and the contractor's fee. Next slide, please. So get started today by visiting our website at sba.gov OSG to find an SBA authorized bond agent in your area. You can only access SBA's bond guarantee through an SBA authorized bond agent and surety company. Your SBA authorized bond agent will answer your questions, verify your eligibility, and help you apply for SBA's bond guarantee when you're ready. Next slide, please. Now, before I wrap up, I'd like to share a recent SBA success story with you. When Vera Hall came to SBA, her company was limited to bonding projects no larger than $250,000. She applied for SBA's guarantee on a $650,000 project that she wanted to bid on. We approved the guarantee and Vera's company was awarded the contract as the sole bidder. Fast forward just a couple of years and this small business is now bonding projects over $3 million thanks to the Surety Bond Guarantee Program. Next slide, please. So what can we do to help your small business today? Feel free to visit our website and connect with an agent or put your question into the chat Q&A and I'll be happy to help if I can. Thank you for your time and feel free to contact me if you have any questions in the future. Back to you, Alan. Thanks, Tamara. And now we'll start our this section of the presentations with uh, the Air Traffic Facilities and Services Organization presenting some of their programs. And we'll, um, to start things off, we'll have Tennille Blackwell. Tennille. Good afternoon, everyone. We can go to the next slide. So we're just going to focus today on the air traffic portion of the $5 billion in which we will receive $1 billion increments over a five-year period. And joining me today, uh, we thank you all if you participated in January, but today we're going to dive a little deeper in our program offices. And so we have Jerry Oswald, who is the group manager for the facility and security services group. We are also going to have presenters from the power services group, as well as the environmental occupational safe and healthy group. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to go over the first few slides just to go over just some reminders of what the funding initially was for. And so it was to, redu to reduce our sustainment backlog, as well as for ATC facilities replacement. And so we've started with the year one funding, and then we'll be moving to year two through five. And you can go to the next slide. And so today what we're gonna talk about is what we do and the opportunities that will be available. Um, and so on this slide, we, we talked about what was available in the first year, but you're also gonna take a deeper dive within the program offices, beginning with Neil Angelotti, and then it's gonna to move to Michael Isaac, and then on to Chris Fowler. Next slide. 
Okay, so uh, good afternoon all. This is uh, Jerry Oswald. So uh, I manage the Facility and Security Services Group, and uh, we're responsible for uh, managing capital programs that are necessary to sustain, modernize, or replace about 12,500 facilities nationwide. Uh, we're organized functionally into uh, five teams, four of which are responsible for, really for the program management. So we have a, a, an unstaffed infrastructure sustainment program area, an en route facilities and enterprise facilities team, a terminal facilities team, and a facility security team that manage all these. We have about 10 programs that, that will manage these, uh, these programs nationally. And what we'd like to do today is to, uh, to present a focus area around the unstaffed infrastructure sustainment team. And they actually, they have four capital programs that are responsible for. Uh, a real property disposition program, long range radar infrastructure sustainment, employee housing, and unstaffed infrastructure sustainment. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Neil Angelotti for a deep dive, dive into these program areas. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So for unstaffed infrastructure sustainment, um, we have the responsibility for over 12,000 unstaffed sites. Uh, for our bipartisan infrastructure law funding, um, we're looking at primarily large structures and replacing communication facilities. Um, in our regular business, we primarily refurbish and replace buildings, radio towers, and uh, the HVAC systems at NASA on staff facilities. Uh, currently, we do have a qualified vendor list um, that we use to award some of our projects, and uh, that is expected to open up in spring of 2023 again. Um, solicitations are advertised at sam.gov. Next slide, please. So just to give you a flavor or picture of uh, what we're dealing with, uh, this is a site in Louisiana communications facility and uh, you see the old uh, infrastructure on the left and the newly replaced structure on the right. Next slide. And this is just a sample of some of the piers uh, where we might put our uh, light lane equipment. And uh, as you see, the old, are at old photos, there's one at the top and on the left, and then the newly replaced pier on the right. Next slide. And now we'll pass it over to Power Services. Next up, we have Michael Isaac. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, Michael Isaac um, with the FA Power Services Group, so this will serve Kind of as an introduction to our group um, if you're not familiar with us already so um, i'll just tell you a little bit about our group and then move into the types of opportunities that we have to partner with small businesses so i'm going to start off with our mission our mission is to provide the best power systems by managing and executing programs to safely establish replace modernize and sustain the national airspace system or nas so what does that mean it means our group is responsible for NAS facility power systems across the country. These facilities range in size from large air traffic control centers and air traffic control towers near airports or cities, all the way to small radio towers or radar facilities on remote mountaintops. Um, our group is responsible for replacing the power systems when they reach the end of life, uh, for establishing new power systems in some cases, or modernizing the types of power systems at these facilities. So next up you see there, uh, our vision. In other words, how do we want to accomplish our mission? So the vision is to be the foremost organization for reliable and clean power systems in support of our customers and stakeholders to meet continuous power requirements of the NAS. So in other words, uh, to me, that means we're, re we're high reliability and we're high stakes. We put in high quality power systems that meet the needs of each facility. And when we replace a power system, we cannot have unexpected disruptions we have controls in place. We work closely with the stakeholders to make sure there's a firm plan. Everything goes according to plan. And if there's any problems, we have you know, mitigating measures or plans for that too. Of course, we can't do any of that without our contract partnerships. So we're grateful for the partnerships we already have, and we're looking for more of the same. Uh, we currently execute across 13 different program areas. You can see the complete list on the slide. Here's a few highlights. We have uh, ASAPS, the Air Route Traffic Control Center, 
uh, critical and essential power systems. We're in the process of modernizing power systems at centers across the country. Uh, AES, alternative energy systems. We currently have a strong push to increase our use of renewables and decrease our reliance on diesel fuel. This encompasses both large and small remote facilities. Uh, we do anticipate opportunities in this area in the near future. Uh, CPDS, critical power distribution system. This is the standard power system for medium to large air traffic control towers and TRACONs. We are currently modernizing these power systems as well. Uh, the last one I'll, I'll highlight here is LPGBS, lightning protection, grounding, bonding, and shielding. All facilities need lightning protection. When you build tall facilities on mountaintops like we do, that increases the need. So we anticipate some key opportunities in this area in the near future as well. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law or bill, um, we like to call it planning. So the graphic on the slide represents uh, power services, BIL projects by proportional value. So what's represented here are nationwide opportunities ranging from very small to very large across all of our, excuse me, all of our 13 program areas. Uh, power services currently has a projected backlog of $1.8 billion through 2028. Through our regular appropriation, we typically receive around $180 million per year. This is divided between all 13 PSG program areas with projects across the country. Power Services is expecting to receive an additional $790 million of BIL funding to support power projects. Combined with our regular appropriation, this should significantly reduce our power backlog. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so what do we need from industry? Across the 13 program areas, Power Services needs uh, engineering support, program or project management, uh, training support, acquisition and life cycle in service support, you know, for engine generators, batteries, uh, arc flash hazard analysis and other power studies. So currently we execute our work across a number of contract vehicles, including NISC, which is the NAS implementation support contract, TSSC, which is the technical services support contract, and we have a, a power services, power system installation and design contract, and several small business contracts for specific needs. Uh, we will continue to leverage those vehicles as well as add new or replacement vehicles to support our program needs. Um, I think they said there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. I won't ask for questions now. I will end with this. PSG is, is dedicated to working with the small business community. We're actively working on a number of small business set-asides uh, to support various needs of our group. Um, these are pre-acquisition efforts, so unfortunately I can't go into further detail at this time. But I know we're looking forward to executing these opportunities to take advantage of our BIL funding and produce real change in the NAS. So thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to working together with you for the mutual benefit of FA Power Services Group and the small business community. Thank you. Next slide, please. And now we will have Chris Fowler. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, she's, as uh, Tanil said, my name is Chris Fowler and I am the program manager for the uh, requirements and compliance assurance uh, and environmental occupational safety and health support programs. Currently, uh, we have two sections that we normally pretty much inspect. Uh, the first one is the facilities. And as you can see, uh, at the current level, as far as environmental occupational safety and health and fire life support, uh, we have a lot of terminal projects that have those. And what we do is we go out, as you can see, and on the slide, we uh, do assessments when, we, when requested, and which includes the inspection of all the facilities uh, regarding, regarding the uh, EOSH and FLS and all those active facilities. And on those design reviews as well, going into the next one, is that uh, we look over every design project starting from as initial as they initialize them as far as when they get initiated all the way up until they're completed. We take a look at the design prior to the project starting. And on those, what we do, and these are construction projects. On those projects, what we do is that we make, make sure that all the stuff that's being installed that is met, the codes are met, and all the comments that are needing to correct those issues that the project was kicked back to, that they're closed. And 
going to the next uh, bullet here is saying on the construction and electronics install site visits, we go out and make sure that we have everything that we signed off on, um, meaning that uh, making sure not only just as it's the code, that is, it is as designed. As you're saying in the other area, as far as the CAI, which is the um, contractor acceptance inspection, we go out and make sure that all the other stuff, EIC and FLS equipment, again, is up to code along the project process, throughout the project on the percentage as far as 10% complete, 20% complete, so forth and so on. And at the end of this uh, on the facilities area, we also take a look and see exactly what we could have done better. Uh, we take a look at and provide those lessons learned throughout the project. Next slide, please. On the system side, which is different from the um, facility side, these are pretty much electronic equipments and other, and other things as far as the system goes. And we do serve as a stakeholder in the, J, in, in the Joint uh, Resources Council for the acquisition of the program, seeking investment of analysis, analysis readiness decision and final investment decisions. What we do on that as far as systems as with the environmental control section, they look at the areas that have been identified and the uh, been identified in the business case and the uh, FID, which is a final uh, program requirement document, FPRD, excuse me, in the environment, in the uh, implementation strategy planning document. We take a look at all those documents that come in as well. And we make sure that everything meets the requirement prior to moving forward. We also serve as a, as a stakeholder in the acquisition program that was, that was mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, we have a lot of checklist items and uh, it, there, there are quite a few out there, but these, this is just to highlight the, the main ones here. The environmental, uh, which you can see is a NEPA, which is a National Environmental Protection Policy Act and the uh, due diligence, which is the environmental due diligence audit. Uh, also, we take a look at the occup occupational safety and health. And what we do in that, we take a look at the books. We make, a sh we make sure that the operational and the manuals are, when they produce them, that they are as, you know, produ produced as uh, per the standard, as far as those individuals that's going to be maintaining those systems. And at last, the facilities are the storage tanks environmental compliance, indoor air quality, and the drinking water as well. And we review the revised uh, orders and we make sure that the consideration for changes that has to be done, we do those as well. And also last but not least is the, uh, the review of the Nash national airspace change proposals for the technical manuals and facilities under configuration management and EOSH considerations. And also, uh, not just that, we, we take care of all of every, all, the, all of the nation and the territories. It's just not in one area, it's all over. Uh, because once it comes across us and we see that project, we wanna make sure that everything is, uh, as, is as designed uh, from beginning to the end. And as of right now, uh, we do not have any uh, requirement for uh, additional EOSH support because uh, those areas are fulfilled for now, are fulfilled now by uh, by contractors. However, there will there should be some openings uh, for that type of uh, support. Uh, even though we don't get bill money, we support we support all of the bill projects. And in every way that's needed, as far as environmental, occupational safety, and health, and the um, RCA program requirements. So, by all means, don't feel the uh, don't by all means do not be discouraged on that. But we do again, we do expect uh, some something to probably be available here in the near future. And I'm finished with that. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for the presenters. Now, once we get to the Q&A section, we also have the representatives from our program offices. And in addition, we have the Implementation Services Group Manager, Timothy Burdick. 
that will also be joining us for Q&As. Back to you, Alan. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and just to remind folks, uh, please put any questions into the Q&A chat box. Um, you have a unique opportunity here to ask questions about the two bonding programs that we had presented, as well as the, the program folks from air traffic facilities and services. So uh, please take advantage of that opportunity and remember to put them in the Q&A chat. I also just wanted to note, um, we got some early questions in the chat. Yes, this, this presentation um, and the slides with working links will be uh, eventually made available on the FAA's BIL site. And now I'm gonna hand things off to Jerry Bird. I know we at least got one question. Um, so take it away, Jerry. Thank you, Alan. And again, I'm Jerry Bird. I am one of the small business advocates for the FAA Small Business Office located in Fort Worth, Texas, but covering the entire US. And the one question that we currently have is our fuel storage tanks, I'm sorry, our fuel storage tanks above or below ground or both. And the answer we have is we have some existing fuel storage tanks below ground, but new storage tanks will be located above ground with little to no exception. And that was answered by Michael. And I don't know, Michael, if you have anything further to add. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, that pretty much covers it. Um, you know, the idea is that moving forward, we're gonna have our fuel storage tanks above ground. Uh, we do have existing ones below ground, but uh, we're looking, looking to replace those. Thank you, Michael. All right, and uh, oh, looks like you just got another one. The next question is, what small business goals will state and local agencies be required to include in contracts receiving federal funds through bill? I don't know if, Alan, if you want to speak. I mean, to uh, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll at least say, um, I think the, if you're talking about subcontracting requirements, I think it really will be on a case by case basis, depending on the solicitation and the project. Um, and then, um, uh, Lisa, did you have something to add? It's, oh, it's probably that name thing. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think it'll be on a case by case basis, uh, depending on the project and um, things of that nature. Larry Ayers is on. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Larry, or does that? pretty much cover it. Yeah, I would say that covers it, Alan. I don't think it's case by case. I don't think we can answer that as a blanket. Right, but for awareness, we do have the ability to, to um, add those requirements into solicitations and things of that nature. And so I'll hand it back to Jerry. Thank you, Alan. Next question is, Verify bill funding will be used for long range radar sustainment. Will any bill funding go towards modernization? And Tanil, I don't know if you or anyone from your team want to answer that one. Uh, this is Neil Angelo. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I can answer that. Um, so the, the long, long range radar sustainment is for the infrastructure at the site. So the buildings, the towers, the brick and mortar kind of situation. It, it is not for electronic equipment. Okay. So I also wanted to ask anyone from AOC, I know we're streaming live. Is there any questions on any of those platforms or anything like that? There are currently no questions on YouTube. The one that we had, we uh, posted a bit earlier. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll hang on for a little bit. Does anyone have any other questions? Again, you have a unique opportunity here to ask uh, all these program officials um, questions about their various programs. Um, and please put them into the Q&A chat if you have additional questions. We'll give it another minute or so. One question just came in. 
it's so, um, I, I, yeah oh go ahead jerry go ahead <laughs> that's okay um so, so as opportunities become available where will they be posted and then the next question are all opportunities listed on sam.gov ellen would you like to answer those sure and then i'll see if larry has anything to add so um so any new opportunities, meaning so some BIL funded requirements will use existing contracts. Uh, some of that was discussed in our first webinar. And again, you can see that first webinar and the slides uh, on the BIL site. But so some of them will use existing contracts. I, the orders on existing contracts wouldn't be intended to be posted on SAM.gov, but any new sort of contract opportunities, or if those are existing vehicles have a onboarding or reopening to add vendors, those kind of opportunities uh, certainly would be uh, posted on SAM.gov. Larry, did you have anything to add to that or did that pretty much cover it? Yep, that pretty much covers it. Give it another minute or so, see if anyone else has any additional questions. Another question came in. Could you please explain how an 8A direct award works for a company that has yet to work with the FAA, specifically for construction contracts? Any suggestions on how best to market the FAA for our capabilities? How best to market to the FAA, I would think, for our capabilities? Alan or Larry? Um, so, I mean, I'll start with, uh, so, to be eligible for a direct award, you need to be a small business in SAM and certified by the SBA, uh, currently certified as an SBA, as an as as um, part of the as being a member of the 8A program. Um, in terms of marketing, uh, I'll let folks jump in, but um, I think the best bet is to sort of like look for opportunities you're interested in and sort of cater your capability statements uh, around um, um, addressing those needs that you're looking to target. Uh, like if, if it's construction related BIL projects, then ensure you talk about your construction experience and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, that would be the best way to sort of uh, market yourselves. And like I said, for, for the BIL opportunities and, and, and any really opportunities you're interested in, you can submit capability statements to the small business program and we'll make sure um, they get appropriately considered. Did you have anything to add either Jerry or Larry? From our standpoint, uh, making themselves known and their capabilities, we have gone out and we have several projects right now where we're doing business with uh, disadvantaged businesses and doing directed awards. And we're kind of walking them through the process. So we would do the same on some of these others. We have a need to do so. So it's kind of need-based. Depends on what your construction uh, background is, bonding, all those type things like that talked about. But yes, I mean, 10, you know, 10 million is a lot for a lot of times for a business um, to get bonded for a period, very first time, even with some of these programs. So I won't say it can happen, but it's a little bit, that's pretty high. But we are working with some right now. So I think that's, you know, letting us know what your capabilities are, what projects you've done. Even if you haven't done any with the FAA, I've done any with the federal government or state and local governments, where you worked with an airport authority, anything <laughs> like that in your capabilities would be uh, much appreciated. So we can make determinations on, on that type of going, uh, doing a direct award and trying to work with you to get, a, get an award. And I would add too, that you would also potentially be able to include any experience you have as a subcontractor. You might reach out to that contracting officer and verify that they are willing to accept that, but most times, um, or a lot of times that is acceptable. Also, you want to make sure you're taking advantage of events that we host and that we participate in. Those are listed on our small business office website under upcoming events or you can get in front of us, um, particularly the ones we host in front of our buyers and our program staff. We have one more question that came in. Is there a small business contractor directory? The site on uh, the list on the website looks to be fairly large companies. Thanks. Alan, do you wanna answer that? 
Yeah, and you, you could jump in if, if I'm inaccurate on anything. But um, so the list that I, I, I posted or the link I posted was for a subcontractor directory to get, um, that's why you see a lot of, uh, I guess a lot of large businesses posted um, um, because they're prime contractors. There are major prime contractors um, that have a, a lot of our contracts um, so it tries to provide the POCs. Having a separate, um, I don't, we don't have a separate um, small business directory. D directory currently, we are looking to add actually a database, um, you know, to actually uh, allow um, sort of small businesses to connect with each other. But that's sort of in uh, process um, and a little far away yet. So, but stay tuned on that. Um, Jerry, did, did I miss anything? The other thing I would say is if you want to take a look at fpds.gov, you can see who we've awarded to that are small businesses for similar type projects that, um, that match your capabilities. And we also um, hope to host a prime sub networking event coming up in the future. Um, so there you might be able to meet other small businesses. And we're looking for that to be virtual. That'll be posted on our website and in SAM, um, hopefully for later on this fiscal year or early next. Thanks for that. All right, we'll give it another minute. All right, I don't see any other questions. AOC, do you see any others in YouTube? All right, thank you. I see that message. I appreciate it. Um, so, um, you know, we appreciate everyone's time. Um, and, um, you know, we hope you found the information uh, uh, informative and, and um, at least of interest. And, um, you know, and we just thank you all for your time. And uh, again, look for the slides and the recording to be posted on our BIL site. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day and uh, many thanks.